Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Program at the Commonwealth Club. And uh, welcome to another one of our over 700 programs since the pandemic started at the Commonwealth Club, bringing you uh, the lectures that we used to have with live audiences here um, online, live stream, and of course on YouTube afterwards. So welcome once again. And today we have a great program with uh, Ode Galore, a professor at Brown University. He has written a book called The Journey of Humanity, The Origins of Wealth and Inequality. And uh, he has a, a theory that traces where the differences in our societies that we now have originated, which, which streams of thought, which influences have made us the way we are now after 150,000 years or more of being human. Welcome very much, uh, uh, Professor Glor, to uh, the Commonwealth Club uh, virtually. You're coming to us from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, thanks a lot for joining us. Now, I, I think we should start with, I mean, this is a project, um, an, an enormous project of saying, how am I going to digest all that information um, and, and, and put forward a few principles, a few patterns. Uh, and I, you can tell by reading your book that what you want is for those patterns to be clear enough that we can use them for our advantage as a, as a race to make a better future for ourselves. I mean, that's the goal, obviously. So. Where did you conceive of this project and, and how long ago? So first, thank you very much for having you, having me in your program. It's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to s share this uh, wisdom that I acquired over the past uh, few decades with the general public. And hopefully this wisdom can help uh, humanity as a whole to uh, reduce uh, poverty and inequality. So if we think about the origin of this uh, uh, large uh, project, perhaps it can be traced to, uh, to my origins. I was born and raised in Jerusalem. And perhaps not surprisingly, given the in inevitable deep historical context of daily life in the city, I developed great affinity to the understanding of the roots of human behavior and the historical origins of ethnicity, human diversity, and the role of deep-rooted factors in the wealth of nation. And this ultimately gravitated me as a researcher to first develop unified growth theory, second, to try to share the insights of this complicated and sophisticated theory with the general public. And this is where uh, we are today. And uh, could you give us like an, an overview of the theory uh, that would give everybody an idea? We'll go into the details a little bit later. There's so many interesting stories that you use to, to, to bring these things out. But, but how about a, a, an overview? I know it's very complicated, but... Absolutely. I will be delighted. So um, the book focuses on the journey of humanity since the emergence of an atomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And it focuses on two of the most fundamental mysteries that surround this journey. The first one is defined as the mystery of growth, namely what is the origin of this dramatic transformation in living standards in the past two centuries after literally hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation. And the second mystery is the mystery of inequality, namely what is the origin of this enormous gap in the wealth of nations. Now, over most of human existence, human life was largely nasty, brutish, and short, mm -hmm. as put it by Hobbes. Humans were preoccupied by survival and reproduction. Living standards were very close to the subsistence level. And there were minor differences in living conditions across time and across space. In fact, only a few centuries ago, one fourth of newborn did not reach their first birthday, and one half of them did not reach their reproductive age. Numerous women perished during childbirth, 
And importantly, economic crisis did not lead into belt tightening, but rather into starvation and extinction. And then quite surprisingly and quite abruptly, in the past two centuries, we see this incredible metamorphosis. Income per capita in the, in, in, around the globe increases by a factor of 14. Life expectancy has more than doubled, and a huge divergence occurred in the pro prosperity of nations. Now, in order to understand this dramatic transformation, let's consider for a moment residents of Jerusalem of the, at the time of Jesus, Roman Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And let's whisk them in a time machine forward to Ottoman Jerusalem in the beginning of the 19th century. Despite this dramatic 2,000 years jump, these individuals will be able to adjust instantaneously to the new econ economic environment. Past knowledge will be largely applicable. Technologies would evolve only in incremental fashion. Life expectancy would remain largely unchanged and would not require any changes in, uh, in the context of the individual mindset. But now, if we take these individuals and we whisk them yet again, but this time only 200 years forward, from Jerusalem of the 19th century to Jerusalem of today, this will be a devastating experience, a shocking experience. Past knowledge would be obsolete. Modern technologies would appear as a witchcraft. Occupations would require incomprehensible skills and life expectancy would instantaneously double and would require individual to have a future-oriented mindset, to consider education dec decisions, to consider saving decisions and life cycle decisions. So in contrast to some conventional wisdom, living standards in the course of human history has not evolved gradually. In fact, evolved quite, dram quite dramatically and abruptly in the past 200 years. Technological progress in the course of human history increased gradually, but nevertheless, it did not have an impact on the well-being of the population. It simply increased the size of the world population. Now, if we observe the evolution of income per capita in the past 2,000 years, we will see a striking phenomenon. Over most of human existence, income per capita is very close to the subsistence. And then, suddenly, in the past two centuries, we see this dramatic transformation, this dramatic takeoff that appears like an eruption uh, and, and of, uh, in, in the context of tectonic activities. And this enormous increase in the standard of living 14-fold increase in the standard of living within the course of 200 years is leading into an enormous inequality in the world economy. And the reason is that some societies are taking off early, other societies are taking off much later. And given the fact that the takeoff is associated with such an enormous increase in the standard of living, an enormous inequality is emerging in the world economy. So if we would like to resolve these two fundamental mysteries, the mystery of growth and the mystery of inequality, we have to have a very long-term perspective. Namely, we have to understand how forces that operated very much in the distant past are affecting economic development today mm. and are affecting the wealth of nation and the inequality in the wealth of nation today. And this leads us in the first part of the book to basically try to understand the journey of humanity, how few individuals that are residing in Africa 300,000 years ago are reaching ultimately the stage in which Stone Age technology is replaced by steam engine technology, industrialization is taking place, and an enormous takeoff is, is uh, taking place around the globe. And as a result of it, the book is in fact allowing us to see the march of humanity forward from the beginning of time to the present, 
resolving the mystery of inequality, resolving the mystery of growth. And what the, the structure suggests to us is that over most of human existence, over 99.9% .9 of human existence, till the eve of industrialization, humanity is in a state of what one may define as Malthusian stagnation. Namely, societies are living in a state in which income per capita and life expectancy are relatively stable over time, fluctuating in a very narrow range. And at the same time, we see great amount of dynamism in the context of the size of the population, the level of technology, and adaptation of, the techno of, the, of humanity to the, te to the technological environment. And what we see over this time period is that despite the fact that at any point in time, it appears that technological progress is, is relatively small and population growth is relatively small and human adaptation is very small, over this 300,000 year period, we see an enormous change in the size of the population, in the rate of technological progress, and in human adaptation. So for instance, if we think about technology, naturally 300,000 years ago, the technology that, that was prevalent was a stone tool technology. And then within this 300,000 year period, we moved into steam engine technology in the eve of industrialization. If we think about the scale of the population, the population of planet Earth, in the eve of the transition to the agricultural revolution, in the eve of the Neolithic revolution, was about two and a half million people. This is 12,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then by the time of the industrial revolution, the population of the world reaches nearly one billion people, namely a 400 fold increase. So despite this incredible stagnation in income per capita and in life expectancy, we see an enormous progress in terms of technology, in terms of the scale of the population, and in terms of the adaptation of the population. And these forces ultimately are allowing the world to escape from the Malthusian trap, to escape from the poverty trap. And why is it so? The size of the population affects naturally technological progress. More people implies more innovators, more demand for innovations, more diffusion of innovations, greater division of labor, and greater amount of trade. On the other hand, faster technological progress permit more people to be sustained. Technology is advancing, people have more resources, and as a result of it, more of the children will survive, and consequently, population will grow. And as population grow, income per capita reverts back to the previous equilibrium position. And this is known as, as the poverty trap that is associated with the Malthusian world. But in addition, technological progress is not affecting only the size of the population, it affects the composition of the population. Namely, over this time period, we see that traits that are complementary to the, to the technological environment and naturally generate higher income, generate higher reproductive success, and consequently they become more and more prevalent in society. And consequently, this change in the prevalence of complementary trade to the growth process is contributing to the growth process and permitting the takeoff from stagnation to growth. So when we think about the wheels of change, one can identify these deep roots, technology, population, and human adaptation. And in the course of human history, in the course of this 300,000 year period, we see that the wheels of change are rotating. Technological progress becomes faster. It supports greater population, more adaptable population, and the size and the composition of the population in turn supports faster technological progress. And in the course of human history, technological progress accelerates and accelerates and accelerates. And then we reach a critical threshold beyond which technological progress is so rapid that in order to navigate this rapidly changing technological environment, individuals must start to invest in the education of their children. Naturally, individuals have limited resources. 
And consequently, they have to economize on the size of their families and to support the human capital of their kids. This triggers the demographic transition, a fertility decline, and this fertility decline permits the growth process to be freed from the counterbalancing effect of population, and consequently the world is sailing into a new era of sustained economic growth. So the first part of the book, as I said, resolves the mystery of growth. Time is moving forward from 300,000 years ago to the present. The second part of the book is devoted to the mystery of inequality, namely try to address the origins of inequality in the wealth of nations. But now the clock is being reversed, namely rather than moving forward in time from the time since uh, the emergence of anatomically modern human to the present, we are moving gradually backward in time. So we start with the existing inequality as we see it today, and gradually we peel different layers of influence. Initially, we ask ourselves how inequality today is associated with proximate factors such as education, human, cap human capital formation more broadly, and technological progress. But then we peel gradually different layers of influence. We ask ourselves how technology, how um, how institutions are affecting matters, how culture is affecting matters, how geography is affecting matters, and ultimately we are reverting back to uh, the place where everything began, the exodus of anatomically modern human from Africa nearly uh, 60,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And as we will see, as we discuss uh, the, the different uh, layers of the theory, in fact, what the theory suggests to us and what the evidence suggests to us is the deep-rooted factors, factors that originated hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago are affecting the wealth of nation today. And in order to resolve inequality across the globe today, we have to devise strategies that are respectful of the progression of each society in light of their geographical heritage, their distance from Africa, the degree of diversity of this population, and the culture and the institutions that evolve in each particular location across the globe. Yeah, that's, and, and the goal, as I said at the beginning, was that to, so that we can maybe direct our future a little bit more intelligently than we do now. Um, in the there's a lot of talk, of course, that, that uh, we're, we seem like we're going back to the t middle of the 20th century right now, and that, that's, that doesn't sound like a great idea to anybody. So um, let's peel back a couple of those things that you brought up. One thing I think to, to explain is the Malthu Malthusian uh, trap, the poverty trap. Um, Thomas Malthus was, uh, was a British uh, uh, writer in the last part of the 18th century, and he's famous for saying that the population will, will starve because it will outgrow the, the, uh, the available food. And, and there's a lot of people then say, well, he was wrong. But you're, you explain how he, he wrote this thing, and he was right about his pattern up until the time he wrote it, but he wrote it right on the, pre uh, the precipice of this change that you're talking about. So maybe that, that should be explained restore part of his reputation as an analyst. <laughs> indeed. So it's quite uh, ironic, indeed, as you suggested, uh, Malthus uh, understood the world very well up to the point in which uh, uh, he was writing his famous uh, trustee. And uh, in fact, the world changed just at the moment that he was writing the book. And uh, the world changed uh, in a very dramatic fashion. So Malthus suggested, precisely as you, as you argued, that uh, on the one hand, technology evolved in arithmetic rate, population in exponential rate. And as a result of it, uh, the society and humanity is doomed to live in poverty. And, uh, and uh, much of this argument is very valid for the understanding of human history till about two or three centuries ago. But then, as I said, in fact, during the Malthusian period, uh, during the period of stagnation that is defined as the Malthusian period, what we see quite clearly is that there are certain forces that are operating beneath the surface 
And these forces are ultimately permit the world to escape, if you wish, from the arms of the Malthusian octopus, namely population growth, technological progress, and human adaptation. This holy triangle, if you wish, are ultimately permitting the world to escape from uh, the Malthusian trap. Yeah, you have a great analogy in your book um, about a kettle uh, being put on to, to boil. And you don't, you know, as, as anybody who's tried to watch a, a, a pot of water boil, you know, it, it doesn't look like anything's happening for quite a while. Um, I mean, we know from the science that something is happening. There's a continual increase in the internal motion, but it's not visible. And then suddenly it becomes visible when it starts boiling. And you basically are saying that humanity was doing that with its increase in population, increase in technology. But, but because of this poverty trap, even whatever little increase there was, uh, soon the population would grow enough so that the average would go down again. So that it was a narrow range, as you said, a narrow range of, of uh, advance. But all of a sudden, it started to boil, and that was 200 years ago. So that's, it's, it's a good analogy, I think, for, for making it clear. But I'd like to go back to yet another thing. Um, you start your book by talking about squirrel uh, outside your, your door and uh, outside your window at Brown. And uh, you say, basically, he lives this survivalist mode, uh, the, the squirrel does. And, and we, know, we know there are quadrillions of animal minds probably on this planet. And they're all in survival mode. And we were in this survival mode for most of our time, too. And now we're moving away from it. Um, it it's, a, it's a fascinating difference. And we'll go back to that. But, you, but let's go to what, yet another thing that you mentioned, because I, I'd like a little bit of sign. Mm, go ahead. Yes, if I may, I would like to elaborate further sure. about this idea of a phase transition. So, so as you suggested correctly, uh, in the development of unified growth theory that I originated, um, the main element, the, the main novelty in understanding the transition from stagnation to growth was this idea of phase transition, namely that for a long period of time, technology evolved and, uh, and become, became faster and faster and faster, but nevertheless, it did not have an impact on the well-being of the population. In response to technological progress, we see that the population of the world is expanding and consequently income per capita is not changing. But then at a certain point, the rate of technological progress and its impact on the return to human capital is changing so rapidly so as to cause parents to realize that in order to navigate this stormy technological environment, they must invest in the education of their children. And consequently, what we see over this time period is that parents are investing in human capital as a, and in order to satisfy their limited uh, resources, they have to economize on the size of their families. Fertility is declining, and as fertility is declining, we have this phase transition, namely the counterbalancing forces in terms of population on the growth process are no longer present and uh, the growth process is freed from these forces. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the transition from water to gas, naturally, as we hit water gradually, at a certain point, we see the evaporation of water, water molecules and the emergence of gas. Now, the same holds in the course of human history. Over most of human existence, we see a gradual change in the level of technolo technology. Technology becomes faster and faster and faster, but no change is visible for a long period of time till the point that a critical point is being reached. And once this critical point is being reached, people start to invest in the education of their children, fertility starts to decline, and then the world is being freed from the arms of this Malthusian octopus. Now, one important element in the context of the understanding of the, uh, the mystery of inequality is that in the metaphor of water and gas, when we boil water, not all water molecules are, are transformed from, from liquid state to a gas state at once. Some do it earlier than others. And this was precisely in the context of the world economy as well. 
Namely, not all societies are moving from stagnation to growth at the same time period. And consequently, an enormous gap is emerging in the world economy in the post 1900 period. The richest economies are growing by a factor of perhaps 15, other economies by a factor of three to five, and consequently, enormous gap is emerging in the world economy. I was going to come to that near the end of the program, but let's go to it right now. So it, it seems, with the analogy being, being a good one, um, that it's not possible for us to get all 8 billion or almost 8 billion of us to take a lockstep step forward each step of the way, that we can't be equal at each point as we try to move forward, that, that progress never takes place that way. Um, and so... The question about how to deal with inequality that is, arises from the fact that you're, you are increasing, in, in a way, the energy of so many individuals, but not the energy of all the individuals to get things done. You, 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 and so you, you don't want to stuff down the energy of the ones who are energetic, but how do you ever keep them equal? You cannot keep them in a lockstep. So there seems to be some institutions that we could use to funnel some of the energy off the top to the bottom, you know, so that, so that it would share in the energy of the growing energy of the human race. And of course, there's the, there's the related question of if we all get much more energetic and use more energy, you know, that, that affects the climate. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that maybe near the end. But this, it's, the inequality is like inescapable if we're going to move forward in a way. Is that, is that true or, is, or do you see a way for it to be escaped? Right. So, so when we think about the emergence of inequality, as you said, it, is, it has to do with the fact that some societies, in some sense, fail to invest properly in human capital at a certain point in time and fail to invest properly in, in, in technology and consequently they lag behind. This does not imply that this is a long-lasting uh, effect and long-lasting long -lasting consequences, namely Part of what we learn, I mean, the, one of the important lessons from, from the journey of humanity, from the book, The Journey of Humanity, is in fact that if we search for these do proof factors, we understand the historical origins of inequality of each particular society, we can devise a policy that could mitigate inequality in each of these individual society and could permit growth in this society and consequently convergence across uh, across the world so there is nothing that prevents less developed societies from participating in the uh, in the development process and as i said once we learn sufficiently about the importance of deep rooted factors in in comparative development institutional factors cultural factors geographical factors and human diversity we will be in a better position to devise a policy and i will be very precise about it as we move forward that can mitigate inequality across the globe and can permit less developed societies to take off and to join uh, the most advanced societies in the world. And I'd like to remind our audience uh, that's watching the live stream right now, if you have any questions for Professor Galore, you can just send them in on the chat and we will ask him of them a little bit later in the program. Um, so you talk about the mitochondrial Eve. This is something that people talk about, that every, every human being that exists on a planet has descended from one woman 150,000 years ago. And, it just, and, and that's a, a sort of commonly out there in the popular uh, knowledge. It, could you explain why everyone is in, in the scientific area uh, is, is so certain that it all goes back to that one woman? Is there, is, it's like DNA evidence of a kind, but, but of mitochondrial D, DNA? What is it that makes us so sure of that? Right. So when people are referring to mitochondrial Eve, they are referring to the fact that when we look at uh, the individuals across the globe today, we can ultimately trace them back to, uh, to um, a mitochondrial Eve, namely a single woman that uh, operated in East Africa, in Africa nearly 150,000 years ago. And naturally, during this time period, there are a lot of women around, but 
um, many of their lineages became extinct mm -hmm. and we are all originated from this uh, particular woman. Now, the, the importance of this has to do with uh, the so-called out-of-Africa hypothesis. So, mm -hmm. so when, when humans are migrating out of Africa, uh, they migrate in several waves. I mean, there is an initial wave that occurs nearly 200,000 years ago. And uh, ultimately, this uh, initial wave uh, is not present in the, in the data, in the sense that either this particular wave led into extinction due to climatic change, or it led into reversion back to Africa. But ultimately, we see a certain exodus that occurs, as I said earlier, as early as uh, 60,000 years ago. And we are all originated from this, uh, uh, from this particular wave. And the importance of mitochondrial Eve is that, in fact, we can see that we are all uh, originated from this, uh, uh, this common, uh, uh, common uh, individual. And uh, therefore, the migration out of Africa 60,000 years ago is, in fact, the origin of all of us. So we don't see sort of independent emergences mm -hmm. in different uh, corners across the globe. Well, your book has so many different um, examples, and we, we, I'm going to pick out just a few here and there. You have a very interesting thing about um, the, what, what shifted in Jewish culture at, at 2,000 years ago, that, that uh, because of what happened with the destruction by the Romans of the temple, um, that the Pharisee group survived. And the Pharisee group had a particular way of emphasizing education, which was expensive, which kind of pushed the poor out of the Jewish culture in a way. Um, it's ironic for me that at the same time, the Jewish sect uh, that was breaking away was appealing to the poor and the slaves to join them. Um, and that became Christianity. So why don't you talk about that story and how it affected uh, the future? Because it was an early example that education was made important. Right. So, so let me just broaden a little bit the, the context. I mean, so, so as I said earlier, when we think about the roots of inequality, we peel gradually different roots. And the first root that we peel is the root of, uh, that has to do with institutions. If you wish, the fingerprints of institutions on inequality as we see it across the globe. And what we see in the context of institutions is that in some places across the globe, we see that societies are adopting growth enhancing inclusive institutions. In other places across the globe, we see that societies are adopting growth retarding extractive institutions and consequently divergence is occurring between these societies. But when we think about the adoption of extractive institutions versus inclusive institutions, or in generally the, 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 the adoption of institutions, broadly speaking, this is clearly not manna from heaven. Institutions are typically evolving in response to uh, economic incentives, in response to changes in the geographical environment and in the environment in which people operate. And in this respect, what we see is that, for instance, when people are transit transiting into the Neolithic Revolution, and population density increases, there is a need for cooperation across individuals. We need a, we, there is a need for social cohesiveness so as to permit the construction of public goods, so as to permit the societies operating efficiently. And consequently, there is a demand for institutions and institutions are emerging. Or other example is if we reside in a certain place on planet Earth, where soil quality is such that it leads into large plantation, then this soil quality ultimately is leading us into um, the emergence of large landowners. And these large landowners ultimately are influential enough so as to establish extractive institutions and ultimately the horrific institution of slavery. Mm -hmm. Or if we think about uh, the disease environment, Naturally, the disease environment is contributing to underdevelopment and ultimately the underdevelopment of centralized institutions that are important for economic development. So again, institutions are reacting to the economic, economic mm -hmm. environment. 
The second layer of influence, and this is related to your question, is the cultural element, namely the cultural factor. So naturally what we see across the globe is that some societies are engaged in the adoption of cultural traits that are growth enhancing and other societies are engaged in the adoption of cultural traits that are growth retarding. Mm -hmm. Not deliberately, but this was the choice given the environment in which they operated. But again, as I said, culture and institutions largely are not mana from heaven. They're responding to the geographical environment, to the incentives that exist in society. So when we think about cultural traits, broadly speaking, then we can see, for instance, that the rise in the return to human capital is changing the predisposition of individuals towards human capital. This is a new cultural trait that is emerging. Mm -hmm. Or when the return to agricultural investment is higher than otherwise, the natural return, then individuals are induced to be engaged in agricultural in investment. They learn how to delay gratification, and this fosters their future-oriented mindset that is critical for economic development. Mm -hmm. Or if we think about societies that originated in places where the soil was suitable for the use of the plow, mm -hmm. these societies naturally adopted the plow, and the adoption of the plow ultimately led to the division of labor between men and women, because plow was relatively heavy, and men had physiological advantage in maneuvering the plow. Mm -hmm. So what we see at the moment is that those places that adopted the plow earlier tend to have lower labor force participation of women today, namely lingering a fact that occurred thousands of years ago in the context of gender inequality. So again, when we think about culture and the influence of culture on comparative development, it is important to note that culture largely is not manna from heaven. But here comes the important question that you ask. From time to time, we do see some random mutation, some random cultural mutation. Mm -hmm. For instance, this particular decree or this particular mandate to educate uh, uh, Jewish boys uh, around the first century uh, uh, C is, is basically, I mean, uh, around the first century, is basically associated with, uh, um, with uh, some sort of a random event, and the random event is the destruction of the temple, mm. and as, as you just suggested, the emergence of the Pushim as the, basically the major uh, influential, influential sect within Judaism. And this particular group is a scholarly group emphasizing the, uh, the study of, uh, of, uh, of the Bible, and ultimately, although at the time it is really inefficient to, uh, to impose this particular uh, cultural trait. Ultimately, it becomes very important as the environment changes and human capital becomes critical in maneuvering an environment that is changing very, very rapidly. So the initial, the, the random mutation that we see there persisted over time, initially due to the fact that it was imposed by charismatic sages, but ultimately it persists because it becomes very beneficial for economic development later on. But as I said, the important element here is to realize that in fact, when we think about uh, 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 cultural mutations, they're relatively rare. Most cultural traits are emerging in association with the economic environment in which they operate. Yeah, and uh, just uh, for the audience, human capital means the development of each mind individually, um, usually through education. Other, there are a few other adult developments too, but. The, the emphasis on that's what should be done rather than in technology and everything is a fairly recent uh, cultural acquisition, although you have this 2,000-year-old example. Um, and I, I loved it that you mentioned that that was really helpful and, and, uh, because when uh, the Jewish people were dispersed, they could take their, their valuable stuff with them because it was in their head. Um, so <laughs> we, they can leave all their goods behind, but they take what's valuable, which is the, the way that they've been trained to think. Um, let's switch to, to China, for example, as a, an example of something that's not in your book, but an example of something that was a cultural trait that just came and went over a couple hundred years and didn't really have any effect. You know, one emperor liked uh, the small feet, 
And so a lot of mothers started to bind their, their girls' feet in order to get the attention of the emperor. And that went on a couple hundred years after that emperor was gone. Um, and then it disappeared. So that's a cultural trait that disappeared. Now, you, you, we're going to talk about China in a bigger issue. China happened to be poor. It, it usually has been the most rich society up until 1500 or so on, on the planet. But it was poor in the beginning, in the middle of the 20th century. And when we started to lose our interest in manufacturing and they started to say, we don't have to be communists, we can start to manufacture, there is this explosion uh, in China of manufacturing. And my question was, you talk about how agriculture is a poverty trap because it's relatively low-skilled work um, and that, that human capital doesn't need to be developed. Is manufacturing just a step above that? Is there such a thing as a manufacturing poverty trap too? Um, that is, that physical manufacturing is also something one doesn't want to stick with? So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So when, when we consider the uh, sort of the emergence of uh, industrialization and the transition from agriculture to industry, Part of this process is associated, as you said, with changes in the demand for education or human capital in the production process. So largely speaking, industrial production is more human capital intensive than agricultural production. More education is needed in the industrial sector than in the agricultural sector. Now, the same holds true when we think about uh, industry versus uh, uh, other sectors. So, in fact, if we think about the evolution of uh, societies and the evolution of industry, we may ask ourselves whether, in fact, industrialization per se was the source of economic development, or, in fact, economic development occurred despite industrialization. Mm. In what sense? In the sense that Naturally, industrialization initially was associated with greater human capital in investment than agri the agricultural sector. But ultimately, industrialization uh, um, generated uh, a tendency for lower investment in human capital. It was replaced by other sectors that were much more human capital intensive. And therefore, those sectors in society that uh, were uh, more industrialized, or these regions of, the, of society that were more industrialized, lagged behind in this process. And ultimately, one can argue and one can establish that industrialization per se was in fact a hurdle for, uh, for the process of development rather than a catalyst once industrialization took place. Mm -hmm. Namely, if we take a, a country like France, and we look at different regions across France, those that industrialize first and those that industrialize later. That those that industrialize first have higher income per capita in the short run, but in the long run, they lag behind. And the reason that they lag behind is that somehow industrialization led to underinvestment in education. This underinvestment in education led to the adoption of less advanced technologies in these regions and ultimately to divergence across regions between those that industrialize first and those that industrialize much later. So your advice to China would be to, to not stick with manufacturing, but to, to, to push ahead with education of their human capital, et cetera. So. Indeed. So the general advice for less developed societies is that the way for, to progress is not necessarily associated with industrialization per se, certainly not traditional industrialization that is low skill intensive, mm. but rather adopting technologies and adopting sectors that are uh, relatively human capital intensive, because ultimately they build human capital formation. Human capital formation is feeding into technological progress and they bring prosperity. I want to go back for a second to your, your example of the plow. I thought that was also fascinating that, that where the plow was used and uh, that caused a greater division of labor between men and women, which caused in general, and it can still be traced back to those areas, that there is there's a distinction in how equal the genders are in the areas that use the plow versus those that, that did not have the right kind of soil, a geographic uh, uh, climate 
climate influence, that they didn't have the soil to, to have the plow be useful. Is there, is there any specific stories from that that, that you can tell that, set, that is a good example of, of where those locations are and, and how that happened or, or how it still persists? Yes, yeah, so if we think about, uh, for instance, the, the southern part of Europe versus the northern part, uh, the southern part has soil that is more suitable for the use of the plow. And uh, if we look at the current uh, uh, degree of labor force participation in Northern Europe versus uh, Southern Europe, we can see this persistent effect of the, the use of the plow in the past on, uh, on gender inequality uh, in the present. And certainly, if we think about the first places that adopted the plow, namely the Middle East, uh, then in the Middle East, naturally, in many of the societies in the region, the gender inequality persisted for a prolonged period of time. So again, it's important to understand that before the adoption of the plow, what we observe is, uh, is uh, equal uh, division of labor, men and women are participating in the field and in equal proportion. But then the plow is being introduced in some locations. The plow requires upper body strength that is common among men and less common among women. Consequently, there is a division of labor. Men are, uh, are allocating themselves primarily to, uh, to agricultural activities, and women are confining themselves to work within, uh, within the household. And this persisted for a long period of time and generated a tradition that, uh, that persists to the present. So to go back to the analogy of the boiling pot of water, um, like someone who's just stopped smoking um, and, and tells everybody else that they have to stop smoking too, um, the, the parts of society that have boiled off the top of the water are looking back at the water saying, you should be water vapor too. Um, and and uh, why are you still water? And I, I, I feel that, you know, about say, the, the, the Middle East, it would seem to be that we would have a lot more patience and that we'd be more productive and effective if we said, oh, you know, you, you have a, a much more what's now traditional male-female relationship and, and a more gender inequality. Um, but that's because of the plow or that's because you've been doing this for a couple of thousand years. That's what we think anyway. And so, so um, you should start thinking about this and this in order to move towards it because you can't just change overnight. Um, it's it's such, so deep in the culture. Indeed. Or do you, or do you so feel that it can change overnight? Yes. Yeah. So, so when we think about these deep-rooted factors, and we talked so far about uh, the fingerprints of institutions, the mm -hmm. cultural factor, and we can discuss geographical factors, geographical factors such as um, soil quality, climate, geographical isolation, they're all affecting labor productivity directly, human capital formation, technological adoption, trade, etc. But indirectly, as I said earlier, they affect institutions and cultural characteristics. Now, in addition, there is a factor that we did not discuss fully, which is human diversity. As I, as I argued earlier, during the migration of anatomically modern humans from Africa, what we see is that gradually the degree of diversity is declining as individuals are moving further and further from Africa. And this has to do with the fact that the size of the population in Africa is relatively small, the departing populations are relatively small, and therefore they're not representing all the diversity that existed among the African population. They reside further away from Africa, and they start to flourish in a new region up to the point in which the carrying capacity of the environment is insufficient to hold them. And then they continue to migrate further. And again, when they migrate further, they carry only a subset of the diversity that existed initially. So in this process, what we see is that societies that are very close to, uh, to Africa are relatively diverse. And societies that are relatively further away, say Native Americans in the America, are relatively homogeneous. 
Now, why is this so critical? It is so critical because diversity has conflicting effects on economic development. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, diversity is beneficial for innovations because it generates cross-fertilization of ideas, complementarities of traits in the production process that is conducive for innovations. But on the other hand, diversity is detrimental for social cohesiveness. It generates mistrust, it generates disagreement about the desirable public goods, and as a result of it, conflicts. Given these contrasting forces, what we see, in fact, is that intermediate level of diversity is beneficial for productivity. But as we move into the modern era, in which, in fact, technological progress is moving more rapidly, the virtues of diversity are augmenting. Namely, societies that are more diverse are having the upper hand. So if we think about the world in the year 1500, during this time period, the dominating, uh, uh, the dominating cultures are present in Asia, China, Japan, Korea, and their level of diversity appears to be conducive to development because, in fact, the homogeneity in this society is more conducive for a cohesiveness than is harmful for innovations. And as a result of it, they have the sweet spot level of diversity. Mm -hmm. But as we move into the modern world, as we move into the, the contemporary era, technological progress is moving very, very rapidly, and diversity becomes very critical for the, uh, the ability of individuals to navigate this stormy technological environment. And consequently, societies like the United States have the optimal level of diversity or the level of diversity that is conducive for development at, uh, at the current moment. So when we think about this, and this is how it is related to your question in the context of all the elements that we considered uh, mm -hmm. earlier, it is important to understand that despite the fact that deep-rooted factors affected comparative development, it does not imply that there is historical determinism in the fate of nation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that if you originated from a certain part of the world, history condemned you to poverty or perhaps uh, 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 bless you for a pros prosperity. In fact, the journey of humanity is giving us a very hopeful outlook with respect to policies that can mitigate inequality across the globe. But unlike the common policies that are being advocated at the moment, which is basically one policy that fit all countries, mm -hmm. in fact, it suggests to us that we really have to focus on, the, on each individual country and each individual history to understand what are the forces that are ultimately preventing certain society from, uh, from flourishing. So let me give you a very simple example. Mm -hmm. Suppose that we, uh, when we think about the World Bank and their policy with respect to education, so naturally the World Bank is advocating the increasing the, the use of education in less developed societies. And that's, that's a fantastic policy. So it's certainly a policy that is conducive to growth. But resources are limited and we have to go beyond the use of education. We have to design the curriculum in an efficient way that is respective of the history of each society. So for instance, if we consider a country that is very diverse, and consequently suffer from social non-cohesiveness, the education policy and the education curriculum should target the idea that people should respect one another, one should respect pluralism, one should respect differences, one should respect other cultural groups. This will foster cohesiveness and will allow this society to benefit further from the diversity that is part of the fabric of this society. But if we take another society that is very homogeneous, the, the policy implication will be precisely the opposite. Use of education is important, but the curriculum should be such that we should di direct the emphasis on pluralism, thinking outside of the box, challenging the status quo, etc. Mm -hmm. In addition, if we consider societies 
that resided in the pla in a place where, say, um, the return to agricultural investment was relatively poor. And as a result of it, there was less of an incentive to be engaged in planting and harvesting, and consequently, long-term orientation was not developed. Future-oriented mindset was not developed sufficiently. Then, again, education policies can target this particular element, namely, part of the education policy from young age should basically foster the ability of children to delay gratification, because it appears that nature and culture in this, in this particular environment ultimately led to, uh, to the lack of this ability. Mm -hmm. Or if you think about the plow that we talked about yeah. earlier, if we know that you originated in a place where the land was suitable for the plow, and as a result of it, greater gender inequality was created, again, the curriculum should target this particular aspect of, uh, of society namely emphasize more the importance of, uh, of gender uh, equality. It's interesting how um, what you said about diversity, that it, it becomes more and more crucial in, uh, as the speed of technological change comes up. Well, that's certainly the, the history of the last 30 years. I mean, the technological change keeps going faster. People complain it's going too fast, and other people are, are, are celebrating diversity in a way that has never happened before, too. So those things are happening not because someone is directing it, maybe, but, but because it's, it's useful under the circumstances. Um, in your field, of course, there's, there's no way to have a scientific experiment where you, you pause uh, one culture and make them all stop doing one thing so that you can see what's going on. But there's something relatively close to that in North Korea and South Korea, um, and you use that as an example, and I think it's very interesting. And um, So why don't you talk about that? Uh, it's interesting also that, they, that South Korea is considered a democratic place, which it is now, but it did not start that way. It did not grow that way. So people, people should be disabused of that idea too. So why don't you explain how that split came? And, it could have, and I, I liked it that you said, if it had gone the other way, and the South was, uh, had one idea and the North had another, they would have grown apart in different ways. So why don't, why don't you explain that? That was interesting, fascinating. Yes, absolutely. So this is taking us back into the role of institutions, the fingerprint of institutions. And as I said before, it appears that at a certain point, some societies are adopting growth enhancing, inclusive institutions. Other societies are adopting growth retarding, extractive institutions. This leads into a divergence in the wealth of nations. This contributes to the divergence in the wealth of nations. And as I said before, to a large extent, institutions did not evolve randomly. Institutions evolved with, in relations to the geographical environment, to the economic environment, etc. But there are what we may define as random critical junctures in which, insti in which institutions were imposed on different segments of societies in a way that allows us to see how important institutions are. And one of the classical examples is the division of the Korea Peninsula along the 38th parallel. And this division naturally led into North Korea that is dominating, uh, that is being a sphere of influence of communism, and South Korea that is influenced by uh, the Western world. Now, till 89, in fact, the two places were run by dictators. But the two dictators adopted different economic policies. In the North, the dictators adopted communism. And in the South, they adopted free market-oriented economy. And this adoption ultimately led into an incredible divergence. And once the South adopted uh, democratic institutions, this divergence continued to persist. And what we see at the present is that South Korea is 24-fold richer than North Korea. And we can see, in addition, that South Korea has 11 years longer life expectancy than, than, than the North. So again, random critical juncture in the course of human history, the division of the Korea along the 38th parallel is generating a, a, a some sort of hell in the north and some sort of pseudo heaven in the uh, in the south. So before you know, I mean, there are so many other ideas to talk about because your book is full of different ideas like this. 
Um, but I, I think one of the things we should talk about before we come to the close of our conversation about what's in your book um, is how this affects our climate change problem. Because we are trying to develop human capital and, and we, we're, you were talking before about manufacturing trap is also a sort of a poverty trap. Um, that if we develop the human capital and not have so much emphasis on manufacturing, maybe the consumption uh, per person would go down uh, because that's not what we're focused on. But, but why don't you, you say how you see this boiling of the pot going and, and, and will we destroy the planet before we have a chance to, to, to get to the next phase? All right. So, so when we think about the journey of humanity as a whole, and as I said, when we basically focus on the first part of the book that takes us from the beginning of uh, humanity in Africa 300,000 years to ago to the present, it appears to a large extent that the march of humanity is unstoppable. Mm -hmm. If we think about sort of dreadful events, devastating events that occurred, say, in the past century, World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, uh, the Spanish flu, and most recently COVID-19, individuals that lived through these tragedies were devastated in the short run. But when we look at the grand arc of the March of Humanity, it appears that the grand arc of the March of Humanity was unaffected by it. Mm -hmm. Now, most recently, we are all devastated by the human humanitarian crisis that emerged in, in Ukraine. And again, the, I think that many of us are surrounded by some sort of a gloomy outlook uh, about the future. But in fact, if we think about the journey of humanity, think about lessons from history, the journey of humanity is providing us with hopeful outlook towards the future. It suggests to us that, in fact, yes, the Ukrainian people, unfortunately, will be devastated for the coming decades. And this is a, a, a horrific trauma. But nevertheless, the march of humanity is unlikely to be affected by, by these tragedies. Now, the question, as you said, is whether, in fact, global warming and the climate change crisis will be the single event that will derail humanity from its relentless march forward. And again, the book is offering a very hopeful outlook about the future ahead of us. Yes, global warming is starting to occur in the course of industrialization. To a large extent, it's an outcome of this technological acceleration that we described so lengthily earlier. Namely, technological acceleration led to industrialization, industrialization led to pollution, and pollution led ultimately into the current problem that we see in terms of climate change. But interestingly enough, the same forces that brought pollution and industrialization are the forces that brought about human capital formation and the power of innovations. And in fact, we could see the virtues of the power of innovations in the context of COVID-19, the ability of scientists to develop revolutionary technologies in such a short period of time is part of this power of innovations. So if we think about this technological acceleration and its impact on the one hand on the power of innovations and on the other hand on the uh, fertility decline. And as you may know, most recently, India dropped below replacement fertility level. Mm -hmm. So what we see is that a certain trend that it op operates across the globe is declining in fertility naturally mitigates the, uh, the current uh, trend in climate, uh, in climate change and provides scientists with the needed time, perhaps few decades, to the development of revolutionary technologies that we cannot foresee at the moment that will ultimately revert the effect of climate change and perhaps will turn climate change into a fading memory in the years to come. Yeah, and uh, to go to Ukraine, that, that would be uh, fantastic. And uh, certainly we don't think that a poor society would be able to fix the problem. Poor societies never have enough resources to try to work on a big problem like that. So the fact that we are a wealthy society allows us to think that it's possible that we might be able to, to 
take care of that problem. Um, a lot of people, of course, are very upset about the Ukraine situation for very good reason. Um, but where does the hope come from? To me, part of the hope comes from the fact that there is no party in either Russia nor Ukraine that is saying, we are strong, we are, should be superior, we are going to kill you to show our superiority. No, they're both accusing the other one of, of, of bombing children and women and, and doing outrageous things, and we don't know uh, what's actually happening. But the fact that they're both complaining about the same thing in, in war of hurting civilians means that we've at least got everybody on the same page that whether we're going to lie about it or not, we don't think that's a good idea anymore. And mm -hmm. I, I don't you, you think at the beginning of World War II you, you might find uh, the aggressors saying, no, it's our right because we're strong to just take what we want. And, and eh, that's a pretty hard argument to make now. So that, that's progress. Um, Indeed, indeed. And, uh, and I think, I mean, so sort of in the context of the controversy, whether technological advancement can be viewed as progress, we should always keep in mind that only a few centuries ago, the, the death of a child was not a huge tragedy in the sense that, as I said earlier, one fourth of children die before, sweet, before reaching their first birthday, and half of them did not reach their reproductive age. But we move into an era in which death of a single child is an extraordinary tragedy. And this is progress. Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult to see it that way because there are plenty of individual examples that are counter to it. But the numbers are tremendous. It's the same uh, with people who look at the, the chance of dying violently uh, six or 7,000 years ago was, was you know, 20% or something like that from the evidence that's dug up. And, and we know it's under one out of 100 now. So there's a lot of, we, we can still complain. It's a, I mean, and we should keep complaining about exactly the same things, but I think it's also important to keep the perspective of uh, are they getting less or are they, they not? Uh, sometimes they think because humanity is always going to complain about whatever is on their mind, that you can tell the level of a civilization by what people complain about. Um, if they're complaining about the total destruction of, of their society and everything, that's one thing. If they're talking about at the university, somebody has, has um, you know, called them a bad name or called them a name that they don't like and made them feel uncomfortable. It's nice that we can complain about being made uncomfortable. Um, and I, I think we should try uh, to, to avoid that. Um, but if that's what we're complaining about, we should remember that we must be making some progress if that's what we're complaining about. Um, great book, so many more details in there. Uh, really appreciate your joining us at the Commonwealth Club, uh, Professor Galore. Um, and I know you had a busy day, and uh, that was a great overview of the main ideas in your book, plus some of the really good examples in it. So thank you very much for joining us at the Commonwealth Club. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 120th year of enlightened discussion. Thanks for joining us. We'll hope to see you again. <laughs> <laughs>